Good morning, Dr. Omunga. Uh, today is March 4th, so I'm delighted to have you here to share or to update or to supplement your uh, chapters in our book and your chapter titled Special Planning and Development Strategies in Dar es Salaam City. Uh, but before come to your presentations, so I like you to invite to introduce yourself to us. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rukmana, for inviting me to this session. Um, I am Dr. Filippo Munga. I am an assistant professor of urban studies and planning, and also um, the advisor for urban management track under the NPA program um, at Savannah State University uh, in Savannah, Georgia. And um, my specific and uh, um, key interests are in uh, planning and decision support, uh, particularly for sustainable urban land use. Um, infrastructure development and community resilience. And I'd like to apply this uh, at the current time, mostly in coastal cities um, where I live now, uh, uh, particularly in Savannah, and also um, um, you know, export best practices to other um, coastal cities um, around the world. And specifically uh, in a place like Africa, where I originally came from. Thank you, Dr. Munga. So now uh, maybe you can uh, start your uh, presentations. All right, let me share my screen. Very good. <laughs> Uh, let me do a slideshow, that will be better. So um, my presentation um, comes from this um, nice looking book, um, the Rutledge Handbook of Planning Megacities in the Global South. And I want to thank you uh, very much, Dr. Rukmana, for inviting me to contribute to um, this book and um, for your guidance as um, um, the editor for the book and towards uh, its completion, uh, especially the successful completion that uh, we can see um, now. I would say it's a magnificent book because it covers um, a cross board of issues that uh, um, are emerging in the global south and that are affecting cities too um, in the global south. And my portion for this book was to look at um, the spatial planning and development strategies in Dar es Salaam City. Um, the reason I got interested in Dar es Salaam City is uh, uh, because I have worked in Africa for a, a specific um, a period of time. And uh, while I was working there, I, um, I, was at, uh, I was in Nairobi and I was working for the city council of Nairobi, um, that is in Kenya, um, which is a neighboring country to um, Tanzania. And uh, I, you know, continuously looked at Nairobi and uh, developments um, that were emerging in Dar es Salaam. And when I compared the two, it looked like they were at par and uh, they were, you know, moving towards growth, but they also had um, almost, you know, similar challenges. Um, so that is uh, when I was requested to, um, to contribute to this book my mind came to Dar es Salaam um, as a city and also as a growing city because um, also of the United Nations reports that uh, continuously indicated that, you know, Dar es Salaam is one of the, you know, fastest growing cities in Africa. And uh, I started wondering, you know, how did it pass Nairobi as a growing city? And, uh, you know, I used to think Nairobi was growing faster than Dar es Salaam. So that was of uh, very 
a particular interest to me. So I started looking at um, Dar es Salaam as one of my um, interest areas as, uh, as a city in Africa and also as a port city. Um, in a, is one of the port cities in Africa. So um, today during this uh, presentation, I'll go through specific things um, that I will cover. Some I'll cover briefly, some I will cover in detail. And uh, you know, they can be expound on, when you read this book, you'll find some um, expansions of uh, my, you know, my discussion um, to date. So I will go through the overview and then I look at the regional context of uh, Dar es Salaam um, in terms of uh, location, historical background, and population growth, and and um, and uh, uh, spatial expansion. Then I will uh, look at the evolution of spatial planning uh, practices, particularly. And uh, after that, I um, I will look at two things in that area. That is the planning thoughts and paradigm shifts. And then as they are actually presented in the chapter. So uh, thereafter, we look at experiences of special planning practices. Um, and here I will just provide a summary overview of uh, the experiences. Then we will move on to lessons learned and uh, I will invite questions. So that is my rundown in terms of how I want to go through this uh, particular session um, this morning. So, um, just to um, mention a few things, how this chapter was uh, created. Um, emerging from my interest, I started looking at the different kinds of information sources that can inform um, this particular um, topic. And uh, the key information sources that I found very valuable included the official public documents. And, um, um, this included policy guidelines, planning documents um, that have already been uh, um, uh, submitted to the government, uh, Republic of Tanzania. And uh, uh, thereafter, I looked at uh, various research reports um, that have been produced, um, journal articles um, who are very valuable um, to inform this uh, particular um, 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 write-up, this particular chapter and also published and unpublished documents, um, which really complemented the journal articles and the research reports. And finally, uh, media reports also contributed towards the development of this um, chapter. So um, that gives an overview of how the chapter um, came about. So looking at Dar es Salaam from the regional context, I'd like to uh, mention um, a number of things here. Um, just imagine from Africa itself, um, according to the United Nations reports, um, it is indicated that Africa is actually urbanizing at a very fast rate. And uh, with that, it means that uh, also the cities in Africa are also urbanizing at, uh, at a, a very fast rate too. And, uh, the reports also indicate that uh, the 15 fastest growing cities are, are in Africa. And uh, uh, also when we look at population growth, which impacts the, the, the growth of cities, um, worldwide, uh, it is expected that by 2030, um, there'll be about 8.6 billion um, people. Um, and uh, African uh, metro areas, will be leading this particular growth, especially in population um, um, distribution. So um, coming back to Dar es Salaam, as you can see the picture that is down here, um, it is indicated that uh, it is amongst the fast, fastest growing um, cities in Africa. So uh, in Tanzania itself, you'll find that uh, um, there are also other cities that are growing but not as fast as Dar es Salaam. And that is due to um, its peculiar location and also some historical background of it, which I'll go through um, very shortly. Um, with population of more than uh, approximately 6 million some years ago, um, the population has continued actually to grow. And uh, it's, uh, 
it's, it's amongst um, the largest cities in Africa. Uh, some reports indicate that uh, it is the Africa's sixth largest city uh, uh, at this time. Um, it is fastest growing port city too in Africa. Um, just, um, you know, behind Lagos, which is um, also a very fast growing uh, port city in Africa. Um, Dar es Salaam, in terms of population, it is expected that uh, the population will grow from the six, you know, around about above six million that was estimated to around 13.4 million by 2035. That's according to the United Nations report. And when we look at that population growth, you see that um, um, it is, you know, surging towards becoming a mega city by 2035, because that is the estimate that they are, they are, they are putting um, um, across in terms of uh, cities moving towards becoming mega cities. So um, if it's moving towards the 13.4 million estimate by 2035, um, that's a clear indication that something needs to be done um, if Tanzania has to reach that status and maintain that status and also continue serving um, its people as, um, as a city. So um, when that threshold of 10 million is surpassed, different challenges normally come in, mostly in terms of planning, um, decision-making um, in relation to governance and uh, development. So that is what all this, uh, uh, that is what this chapter um, will try to look into in terms of where has Dar es Salaam come from and where, um, where is it going? But then before I get into that, I just want to give um, some historical background because that has a way of informing um, um, my argument in terms of how Dar es Salaam uh, Dar es Salaam's planning initiatives have changed over time and how that has impacted the, the, you know, the different um, development strategies um, that uh, should be valuable for Dar es Salaam as a city. Um, historically, um, Dar es Salaam began as a fishing village. So it began as a very small village on the coastal um, um, area of Indian Ocean. So, um, it was a fishing village that served, you know, very few number of people who are just living there, using the ocean as their source of, as their source of, uh, um, um, of, of food and uh, and trade and investment. But then um, that was some time in the mid nineteenth century. However, um, because of trade when it developed as a port and as a trade center, the Arabs came in and started, you know, revamping the trade um, along the coast. And that is the time um, where, the, when Dar es Salaam was founded by Majid bin Said, or, or the Sultan of Zanzibar in 1866. This is important because that is where um, reorganization of the village began and uh, Dar es Salaam was now growing to become a town that can be used for trade and investments. So um, that didn't stay very long because uh, the city fell into decline after uh, the death of the Sultan in 1870. But it was revived back in 1877, 1887, when the German East African Company established their station there. And this is the time you see. Um, the colonialists coming to Africa to colonize part of um, the different countries in Africa. So um, their entry point, especially for the German East African company was through Dar es Salaam. So when they put their station there, then um, they started revamping um, construction of things like the railway line that made Dar es Salaam now start growing into a town. However, that also did not stay long because um, that kind of administration changed very quickly into uh, the British um, col colonial administration. And that was uh, uh, in the early 1900s where the British uh, forces took control of Dar es Salaam um, from the German um, East African uh, company. 
So um, they renamed it and uh, made it the capital of Tanzania at that particular time. So um, this was important because when the British came for them to colonize and to make sure that they were benefiting from these um, towns that they were developing, they started some form of planning. So when they started some form of planning, um, they are planning mostly for Dar es Salaam was segregational. So they are planned places for Africans in one area, some places for Asians and some places for the whites. So we, we start seeing some form of planning there, but it's segregational in nature. So um, this went on and uh, um, Dar es Salaam in around 1961, um, became the first capital of, Daris, of, of, of Tanzania. But this, um, this status was moved to another city to the interior, that is Dodoma at around uh, in 1973. However, even after moving the capital from Dar es Salaam to Dodoma, and that was you know, due to some political, um, political um, reasons, um, Dar es Salaam has remained the location of most government offices um, um, in Tanzania. So it is still houses most of the administrative um, offices for the government, and it is divided into five districts. So that shows us how Dar es Salaam remains one of the important uh, cities um, in, in, in Tanzania. And uh, um, it determines um, um, Tanzania's um, impact in the East African region. And also as a port city, it functions as an avenue for trade for also other African countries, including Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Malawi, Zambia, amongst others. So that has made it as a very critical point, a critical uh, port city in the East African region. As you know, there is also Mombasa, which is also a port in Kenya, but uh, in terms of uh, quite, you know, uh, in terms of competition and in terms of volumes of trade, they compete between the two. So Dar es Salaam, you know, competes on the Southern part of the East Africa in terms of um, goods and uh, investments and uh, manufacturing uh, industries, et cetera. So that gives us, you know, an overview of you know, the historical background of Dar es Salaam. So that has made it what it is today. Because with all this development coming, you know, um, what came, came with all this development is the spatial expansion of the port. And that is because of the population growth, which was attracted by um, the development of uh, the industries and uh, the, uh, you know, um, the offices, in, in, in Dar es Salaam as a city by both the colonialists and um, now the um, Arab investors, Indian investors and other Africans um, who live in Dar es Salaam. So that gives us you know, a general overview in terms of how the history has impacted the development of Dar es Salaam. So with that on, uh, on the background, I say that the rapid growth of Dar es Salaam in the future actually will come from the urbanization aspect of it, uh, of, 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 of the country, and also from the attraction um, in terms of investments and also as a port city. So um, at this point, I will go to the next section, which is how does all this impact um, the evolution of spatial planning practices in Tanzania? Um, this historical background brings us to two particular possibilities in terms of evolution of spatial planning, which we will see from um, the metropolitan um, from the metropolitan plans um, that have been prepared and other plans that have been prepared for the city. So one theory that comes to the fore is the evolution of planning thoughts, which is basically evolution of planning ideas. Yeah, um, theoretically, 
um, it comes from the background whereby we are looking at planning um, advancement in terms of changes in assumptions, changes in models, um, changes in tools and other improvements in approaches and practice for a specific period of time. That's what planning theory uh, puts forward uh, in terms of evolution of planning thoughts. The other um, thing that comes to the fore is a paradigm shift. So we also see there might be some paradigm shift in terms of uh, planning practices um, in the Islam. Paradigm shift um, basically means um, you know, like a complete change of approach to planning. So when there is a complete change, you know, towards from one particular aspect of planning to totally a different kind of planning, then we start thinking about a paradigm shift. And um, these two aspects are seen um, in the development of uh, or in the evolution of um, spatial planning uh, practices in the Islam. And just to bring this um, to, the, to, to, to the fore, uh, as, um, to explain and expand how this has happened, you see that um, during the colonial administration, there was some planning that began in 1891, and this was just a physical development plan. And during this time, it was the first um, era of colonialism, whereby they just wanted to organize spaces and they prepared what was called the physical development plan. But in 1949, um, the, the Dar es Salaam master plan was introduced. And this was introduced um, by the British after they colonized um, 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 the country. So this was supposed to come up with a specific plan for land uses and other uses um, within Dar es Salaam to grow it as a city so that it can be functional both administratively and, uh, and, and both physically, uh, especially um, in terms of growth. However, we see that the movement from the 1891 plan and 1949 plan, that I would call a paradigm shift, but um, it was a very small kind of a change. That is why I, um, I, I want to just put it there as one of the anecdotes uh, in this particular discussion. However, we see big changes between 1949 plan and the 1968 plan and the 1979 plan. When you look at these three plans, they were developed in a way that they were addressing something. They were addressing some changes. And most of this, um, um, transitions between 1949, 1968, and 1979 plans were based on um, either what was not functioning and needed some improvement or something needed to be added in the plan. So that is what created these particular transitions in this plan. And this is what I would call the evolution of planning thoughts or planning ideas, because um, plan, the ideas were changing with time, depending on the challenges of population, depending on the challenges of, um, uh, of, of, of governance, in terms of what was needed to, to, to make the city function, in terms of government policies. So those three changes are quite important and they reflect evolution of planning thoughts. The other two changes that came thereafter, that is the 1992 Strategic Urban Development Plan, um, shows what is, I would consider, paradigm shift. This is because um, there was a total planning change, you know, change of ideology, change of principles from the master planning to a strategic planning perspective. And the strategic planning was brought basically because of the um, the influence of, uh, let me say, like the World Bank um, and the United Nations that actually convinced the, governor, uh, the, the government, the Tanzanian government, that if the city moves from the master plan to the strategic urban plan, then it would function better. So they changed the ideology from master planning to the, uh, um, strategic planning perspective. However, we will see um, um, very shortly in terms of the implementation, how um, um, 
this was implemented and the challenges it encountered. Before now, there was another paradigm shift in 2012 to master planning again. So you can see um, these changes become very interesting, whereby we move from one, one plan to another, to another, and then overhauling the old system, moving to a different system, and back again to the old system. And that's a, you know, that's, that's a very interesting kind of uh, movement in terms of uh, evolution of planning uh, practices. So um, that shows us something in terms of when challenges, in terms of planning, especially uh, with the challenges of the currently and uh, uh, complex, uh, complex uh, urban environments in which uh, have been created um, 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 between time and space. So what are the key experiences um, that we can derive from all um, these changes? Um, these key experiences also emerge from the specific plans that um, were evaluated during this, um, uh, during this uh, write-up or in the preparation of this chapter. So I will look at this in terms of planning initiatives and plan implementation. First of all, I look at what kind of initiative was there and uh, um, how was um, the implementation effected uh, for that particular initiative and was it successful or not? And if not, uh, if it was not successful, um, um, what happened thereafter? So with that in mind, um, I start with the 1891 physical development plan, which was the first physical development plan prepared by the you know, Arab administrators uh, when they first um, 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 came to Tanzania through Dar es Salaam. So you find that they developed this plan to help them, as I discussed earlier, um, start governing um, the town and move Dar es Salaam from the village to a town uh, with some improvements. However, this was partly implemented because of the issues I discussed earlier, um, which included, first of all, the passing of the Sultan and then um, some conflicting interests between the Arabs and, um, and, and, and the Germans, which led to uh, the decline and then formulation of the first um, master plan um, um, of Dar es Salaam. However, this first master plan was prepared by um, the British because um, when they looked at um, how the physical development plan was working and how it was uh, uh, prepared um, and, 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 and improved by the Germans, it didn't um, attain the standard of the British town planning um, approach or principles. So they wanted to bring that on board um, so that they can um, um, have an influence of Dar es Salaam, both institutionally and uh, um, um, from governance perspective. However, for this particular plan, you find that, um, yes, it was implemented. However, most of the proposals that were expected to be um, uh, effectively implemented were not um, really attained. So, um, they tried implementing as much as possible, but uh, they did not succeed. Um, mostly, I would say that uh, uh, with the enactment of uh, some laws and regulations, they tried to emulate what was happening um, back in, 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 in Britain. However, I would say that um, Dar es Salaam had a totally different um, kind of environment. And um, when they realized that, they revised it to come up with a second Dar es Salaam master plan, which was uh, prepared by a consulting firm um, in 1968. This was also partially, you know, um, it was partially implemented, um, though I've indicated that it was hardly implemented. That is the partial implementation. Some parts of it were implemented um, depending on the political, economic, and social development realities of the 1960s and 1970s. But it did not attain um, um, the expectation in which it was, uh, it was prepared. So um, 
the reason being, as I've indicated under my remarks, that it was ignored in favor of a government development program. Now you see, um, from the government governance perspective, we look at planning and politics um, working, let me, let me not say against each other, but working or influencing the implementation of a plan. So um, at this particular time, you find the government um, favored more of a development program than a master plan. And that impacted the implementation of the 1968 um, master plan. Because of that um, government uh, um, favor of uh, development uh, programs, they decided to prepare a third Dar es Salaam master plan. And this master plan was supposed to be in, um, um, in relation with the development programs that the government were, um, was preparing. However, also this went through the same um, 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 problems whereby no deliberate efforts were made to implement its main proposals, mostly because of the required resources, which is something that uh, impacted most African um, governments, local governments especially, um, the economic hardships, the rapid population growth, and you know, um, government uh, weak institution that engulfed the political environment of, um, of, of, of Tanzania. So um, with that in mind, you find that Yes, they prepared a good plan, that is a third Dar es Salaam master plan, but its implementation required resources which were not available at that time. And this is where now the, the, the next plan comes in in terms of uh, um, the influence of the World Bank and the United Nations, whereby they, uh, they come up with an idea that if the master plans are not working, then Dar es Salaam should, try, should, should, should uh, try the strategic urban development planning um, approach. And um, when they introduced this, they, uh, um, they came with um, the funding for that. And uh, with that, as part of an incentive, the government decided to adopt the strategic urban development planning approach. And this was a new approach. And um, 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 brought in through the United Nations and the World Bank. Um, this shows us in terms of, um, even with the introduction of new approaches, without resources, without collaboration, and without um, buy-in by the people who are implementing these programs, um, it is still shows us limitations in terms of implementation. So the Strategic Urban Development Plan which was prepared was also just implemented on a limited version and later it was abandoned because it was not um, achieving um, 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 what the government expected it to achieve at that particular time, that is between 1992 and 2012. Um, so the government reverts back to um, the new master plan in 2012 which was supposed to you know, um, cover 2012 to 2032. You see that's a 20 year period, um, which is normally what um, um, most countries have recommended for um, either comprehensive development plan or any uh, major plans for the city. Um, however, this one was actually not implemented at all. And the reason being, there was a struggle between the strategic urban development planning and reverting back to master planning. And then the government in terms of resources, uh, in terms of uh, buy-in by the community and in terms of uh, um, um, our funding, they didn't um, want to go forward with that master plan. So between, 19, uh, between 2012 and 2018, I would say that there is no clear planning that went on in the Salaam. There is no clear particular plan that was being used to direct development in um, Dar es Salaam as a city. So um, 
the 2018 was prepared to cover what has been missed between 2012 and 2018, and also to update any other thing that was required by the government to see whether this plan can be implemented for 2018 to 2040 time, time period. According to reports, um, this is also yet to be implemented. So you can see that gap has developed. And at this time, I would say, um, with that particular gap from other experiences also in cities like Nairobi, um, you'll find that um, planning might, at this particular time, following development. And this is what creates a lot of informality in planning in, in most African countries. So this has a potential of creating informal developments, whereby a development moves forward and planning will follow later. And you know, we experienced the same thing um, in, uh, with Nairobi um, because of the implementation also of their um, development plan that was, uh, that was lagging behind time and behind development. So this is an overview summary of the experiences of spatial planning practices in, um, in Dar es Salaam city. So what do we learn from this? The key lessons we might learn from this um, emerge from the evolution of spatial planning practices itself. The second, we look at the plan making approaches generally, and then we look at lessons from the implementation strategies themselves. So when we look at the evolution, from my presentation, you realize that the evolution of planning ideas and paradigm shifts might not be considered as a fantasy to effective planning. Because you see, Dar es Salaam has moved from, from the initial master plans to sustainable urban development planning and back to master plans without achieving concrete move in terms of what is required to move Dar es Salaam forward as a city. And this might actually be even more challenging when Dar es Salaam becomes a mega city. So while we are thinking of moving from one planning practice or moving in between planning practices or planning ideas, we should think about about what challenges have been experienced by a particular planning approach or idea. But in addition, we should add some analysis of it so that we move forward with an evidence-based approach in terms of planning ideas or complete paradigm shifts in planning practices. So, just moving between planning because of funds or because of external pressures might not help countries achieve what they need to achieve um, in terms of uh, um, the recommendations or the proposals lying in those plans. So that is one thing that we should learn um, from the evolution of special planning practices in Dar es Salaam. The second thing that we should learn is that we need integrative approaches and innovative strategies to achieve the answers that we need for the cities that are growing, especially in Africa. The reason being, um, with integrative approaches comes collaboration. And with collaboration comes community buying and with that, we start moving forward as a group or as a community. And that integration brings in um, what we call responsibility and it brings in um, the push and the championship for these particular plans to be implemented. 
if not even implemented fully, but implemented to a certain level that will benefit the communities and the cities themselves. The other aspect is the innovative strategies. With the kind of environment that we live in, innovative strategies are important because we cannot continue recycling the kind of planning approaches that we have implemented before or that we have experienced before. The current environment is changing so fast with elements like climate change. This will require innovative strategies and even innovative approaches for the cities to survive this kind of uh, extreme events, for example. So Tanzania and especially Dar es Salaam being located on the coast or on the coastal area of Tanzania, there are some threats, especially from climate change events that might impact Dar es Salaam in the very near future, especially in terms of sea level rise, for example, flooding and other environmental issues. And we need to plan for all these things. So innovative strategies to planning will be paramount in this aspect. And with that, I would want to bring on board the integration of urban data analytics and governance strategies. That will be important because we need to collect data, know where development is going, know where what we should do. And at this time with the technologies that we have, we are able to collect data at any point in a city. And if we can collect this data, analyze this data and let governance be informed by analytics, then that will help us move forward instead of just politicizing planning itself. So with the integration of urban data analytics and governance will come the kind of an approach whereby we can term as evidence-based approach to planning and implementation of the results or the outcomes of these plans. Finally, plan implementation strategies are very important because if a plan is there and it cannot be implemented, then it becomes a useless plan. And with quality plan implementation strategies, the cities benefit, the communities benefit, and the growth in terms of evidence base becomes quality in nature. So when we are looking at plan implementation strategies, we should look at how collaborative is a plan. So we should you know, move towards collaborative implementation of plans and that requires the capacity of stakeholders. So we need to look into how do we bring stakeholders to a level whereby they can help with implementation of these plans. Institutional support is also needed and this includes both the politicians and um, the private sector. So the public private sector partnership will be important in this area because both are beneficiaries of all these systems. So if we find innovative ways and strategies to make sure that we concretize on public private partnerships, then we will capitalize um, on the resources that we have and uh, we will um, um, move forward um, with the institutional support that is much needed for implementation of these plans. And finally, um, effective evaluation is required for the successes and failures um, of these plans, because this is critical to inform decision-making. We should just not just abandon a plan because we don't want it or because somebody has come up with a lucrative idea with some funding. We should move or review plans after effective evaluation of successes and, and their failures. This emerges from the kind of uh, analysis that I was undertaking whereby some plans did not even have time 
to be evaluated for their successes and failures. The time was very short. A plan is supposed to be for 20 years, but after five years, it's abandoned. Or after um, three years, the plan is abandoned. That's not uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, uh, enough time to evaluate the success of a plan or the failures of that plan. So we need to have a time frame in which plans can be evaluated for their successes and failures. And that will be important to inform decision making in terms of where do we move from one particular point in time. So these are basically the key lessons that were derived from, uh, um, from this um, um, study and from this chapter. Um, some, some of these summaries are expounded on the book, uh, on, 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 on the book chapter itself. So if you read, you'll find some expansions in terms of explanations and um, what some of these things mean. So at this time, I will uh, invite questions um, 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 before we conclude this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Omunga. It's very fascinating uh, presentation. I, I learned a lot uh, from your presentation. Uh, even I already read your chapter. Uh, so my question is before uh, come to the uh, spatial planning, uh, let give us a context of Dar es Salaam. As you told us, uh, it was in 1870s or 1860s when that Sultan came and then Germany came in 1900 and then later on uh, British, right? Uh, my question is, what is the legacy of colonialism uh, from Arab or from Germany or from British that you still see today in, in the result? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because um, even with the transitions that we can uh, that we have uh, seen emerge in Dar es Salaam, um, there are still quite a number of elements that uh, of colonialism that we see um, in Dar es Salaam. One of them is um, let me see um, let me talk about the spatial um, um, land use. Um, organization in Dar es Salaam. You will see that, for example, when the Arabs came, their interest was trade. And they concentrated on trade, especially developing of the port itself and the city center. Give, give me a second. Can you, can you close the, the share, screen share? Anyway. Ah, okay. Stop share. Okay. All right. So that's so, from Arab. Okay. Continue. Yeah. So you will see that uh, the Arabs were interested in trade. And to date, most traders in Dar es Salaam city, you will find are mostly Arabs and Indians. And now Africans are joining in and there are a few um, um, white um, investors who are within the city. But most traders are, most traders are, are, uh, are uh, Arabs and Indians. So that's one thing that we will still see, continue seeing in Dar es Salaam. The other thing that we see um, in Dar es Salaam is the infrastructure that was that was developed by that was developed by the colonialists, the British and the Germans. So when the Germans came, their first thing was their first thing was um, Give me one moment. Yeah. Their first thing was to develop the railway line to open up mm -hmm. the city to the interiors. So that railway line still exists um, to date. Um, then the British came and now started reorganizing land use with a view of the infrastructure that was existing and mm -hmm. to expand that infrastructure. 
So we can still see the initial planning in terms of land use done or completed by the colonialists still exist, and especially in terms of segregation. Mm -hmm. There are some areas that are, were you know, designed or zoned for white, let me use that term, for the white colonialists. There are areas that were zoned for black Africans, others were zoned for Asians, and there are areas that have remained for Arabs and Indians. So you'll find Arabs and Indians occupy mostly around the city center. Then when we go to the suburbs are for the white. And then the, the, we, we have areas for Africans and areas for Asians. So that continued to exist and uh, it's something that exists today. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, next is about the growth of uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, you said that it started as a fishing village. And of course, uh, the data that we use in the book from Undesa in Dar es Salaam uh, in 1960 is still 162,000. And then just reach uh, 2, 000, 2 million in uh, 2000. So there is a rapid urbanization from 1980, 2000, and 2000 to 2020 today. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah, you already said that because of the port, right, uh, become a factor there. Is there any uh, policy changes that made uh, Dar es Salaam grow faster or any open to foreign direct investment, something like that during those time until today? Yes, uh, let me just start um, um, earlier on. Um, the first key change that came up was when Dar es Salaam got independence. So after the independence, everywhere was opened up. There were no restrictions that were there when the colonialists were, were still in power. So because of that, there was a rush of migration for people from wherever they are now back to the city. So with that in mind, you see Dar es Salaam's population starts exploding right away after independence. And that was because of the policy changes and the regulations that were you know, adjusted to allow Africans and other populations to, 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 to come to the city. The other thing that we realize is, apart from the in-migration, is uh, that there is a change in demographics between that time. And because of increase in um, population growth amongst the youth, that also um, um, impacted the expansion of, uh, of the growth, especially of population that was now and this time to live in Dar es Salaam. And with that, you see um, we, Dar es Salaam starts expanding in terms of uh, investments and uh, in terms of uh, location of industries, manufacturing industries, and that attracted the youth. And those are some of the things that actually um, um, affected the you know, rapid population growth in Dar es Salaam. And then based on the projection uh, from Undesa and also you just uh, presented too, the rate of growth will keep continue in the next 20 years to come. Mm -hmm. So of course it's become a challenge. So what do you see uh, this challenge that will present it to, to special planning in Dar es Salaam. Now, when we look at Dar es Salaam now and the future, we see um, um, a city that is trying as much as possible to correct the planning that has been there before. And uh, um, that also is being impacted by the current challenges of especially environmental change. Since Dar es Salaam is a port city, I spoke about climate change. 
that is something that uh, will impact Dar es Salaam in the near future as much as possible. And the current planning is not able to address that. So I, I, I foresee changes again in planning, especially in Dar es Salaam, to take care of issues like climate change, which will include sea level rise, flooding, and population growth itself because people will be moving where we are having environmental risks. So we, I, I foresee a kind of planning that will have to integrate environmental strategies within it. Do, do you think that uh, 2018, 2040 uh, master plan is still in the developing? and not really addressing those challenges? Um, it addresses some of those challenges, but it looks at more of the interior other than the coastal area. When we talk about sea level rise, yes, it is included in that plan and other environmental kind of um, um, issues that needs to be addressed. Mm. But the only challenge is the implementation recommendations are not budgeted for, are not, let me say, organized in a way that can be affected by the government. So um, when the plan is being implemented, there'll be need for a lot of uh, funding towards addressing those issues, which I think I can still foresee if the city is not prepared in that particular aspect, then, we will um, get into the same trouble of the plan not achieving what it was meant. Okay, let's move to the opportunities. So what opportunities could arise based on what you see in the past, based on the things that could happen in the future for effective implementation of spatial planning in the Rizal? So one, one um, thing that I see is the interest by private investors to partnership with the government, having an outlook of Dar es Salaam as a fast growing city. So there are quite a number of investors who'd like to come and invest in Dar es Salaam as a city and have their companies in Dar es Salaam as a port city because it, it opens for them other opportunities too. And with that comes the interest, um, uh, interest for partners, partnering with the government. So that's one opportunity that is coming there that should be explored further. And uh, we should have innovative ways in which we can partner with the private sector to make sure that um, the plan is implemented effectively, especially in the future. So that is one. The other opportunities that come um, with the current, you know, with the current challenges that have been, been experienced is the explosion of data and information. We should be able to um, use the current information network or information infrastructure for decision making as compared to how it used to be before. So governance should be able to be improved by you know, annexing analytics into the information decision support system of, uh, of, of, of the city. So as we move forward, we see two things coming up. One is the collaboration, the partnerships, and two is the data that can be used to inform decision-making and also inform the planning itself as we move forward. So those three key things are opportunities for investment and for governance and for moving forward. Very good, thank you very much. Dr. Rumga, thank you very much for your uh, presentations and responding to all my questions. It's very, uh, very good. Uh, <clears throat> presentations and also uh, discussion that will supplement 
the chapters that you wrote for the book. So in the last two minutes, maybe you can give us a concluding remark from your uh, writing in the book and also from your uh, video presentation here. I would like to say that uh, this um, was a very um, interesting process in terms of writing this and uh, in terms of also exploring um, um, Dar es Salaam as a city. I, 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 I got to know a lot about it and also looking at the plans. They are very good um, proposals in, in, in the current plan, which uh, if implemented definitely will take care of Dar es Salaam as, um, as, um, as, as, as a mega city in the coming years. So that is very interesting to me because um, um, I would like to encourage more studies in this particular, um, especially for coastal cities and especially African coastal cities because they have the potential. So we need to tap into that potential and move them forward to compete with other port cities in the world. And that is what I envision, and that's what interests me, especially in Dar es Salaam as a city. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Omunga. Thank you very much for your time with, with me, with us here. All right. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity once again. Thank you.